After additions and transformations, materials can also be transferred both up and down a soil profile. The authors state that vertical transfers of materials through soil generate distinctive soil profiles, that is, the vertical layering of soils. This here is a generic soil profile showing some of the major horizons that form during soil development. The density of dots represent differences in concentrations of organic carbon or soil organic matter material. So when we take a look at a generic soil profile, often they'll be divided up into different horizons. And these horizons are given letters for names. So the O horizon is the organic horizon. And this is often subdivided into an OI, an OE, or an OA that represent different degrees of decomposition of that organic material. So when you have a bunch of leaves that are be at the top of the soil surface, when they become slightly decomposed and there's a layer of that, that's your OI horizon. Then you have an OE and an OA horizon that represent differences in the degree of decomposition. Not all soils have these differences in the O horizon or even an O horizon that will be there, but that's the organic horizon, which is generally the topmost horizon. Now below that, we'll typically find what's called the A horizon, which is mineral material that would have been present initially in the bedrock or deposited that's mixed with humus or organic matter, soil organic matter. So we have our O horizon at the top or A horizon below that. Let me skip over E and then go to B and C. From the bedrock, when you have a little bit of weathering, this zone is considered the C horizon. It contains unweathered parent material, and it looks like a lot like the bedrock with very little secondary mineral production. In between the A and the C horizon is the B horizon. And this is often a zone of accumulation, but it's an intermediate horizon. So in many soils, you'll have an O horizon, an A horizon, a B and a C horizon, and then bedrock down below. Now the E horizon, you can often have if you have leaching of materials that then become deposited. And then this area right here looks a lot different than the A, both the A and the B, and that's due to the deposition of leached products such as silicate clays and iron and aluminum oxides. We'll show some examples of this in just a second. So for a typical soil, it's important to know that you'll, you can have an organic horizon, which we'll call the O horizon, and then an A, a B, and a C horizon above the bedrock and sometimes an E horizon. Now there's two directions of movement within the vertical within the soil. First one is downward movement of material. And the authors use an example of a spodosol as a good example of where you have downward movement of materials. So the spodosol are acidic soils with a strongly leached surface layer. So the organic layer would be right up here, and then you typically would have your A layer right here that leaches material down into an area that ends up being your E horizon. And you can see that white material, which are precipitates that had leached down from the surface. Below that, you have your B and your C horizon. So a spodosol, they tend to be acidic soils with a strongly leached surface and an area where you have deposition of materials below the A horizon into an E horizon. Now another example of where downward movement is important is in a caliche. And caliches are calcic horizons. It's where you have calcium carbonate that forms in a specific horizon. Now you tend to have caliche in relatively dry areas, in arid soils, and your caliche layer is this hard white layer right here, relatively impermeable, tends to be pretty hard. And that happens when you have downward movement, downward leaching of material that then precipitate out. And again, this would often be considered an E horizon with an A horizon above it. Now the authors talk about some of the chemistry of the formation of, of calcium carbonate. And essentially what they want to emphasize is that you can have calcium carbonate that when it reacts with carbonic acid, the calcium becomes soluble, and then you get carbonates that form bicarbonates. And so 
this often this reaction can go either direction and when you have your soil that has a lot of calcium in it that calcium can move down in the soil profile and then precipitate out where it's less acidic or it starts to dry out and then you form your calcium carbonate down here and this layer represents basically how far water is going to move before it evaporates and tends to dry out. And in those arid soils, the waters don't go all the way out to the bottom and out the bottom. They'll go down to a certain point in the soil profile typically. Calcium carbonate will precipitate out and then the water is taken up or evaporates. So precipitation as calcium carbonate occurs under conditions where you have relatively high pH. So it takes acids like carbonic acid to solubilize calcium carbonate into calcium and bicarbonate. And calcium, if we can reverse that reaction by having a little bit more basic conditions, and that drives the reaction to the left. Now, in addition to downward movement that typically occurs with water moving down through the soil profile, we can also have upward movement. So water rises for a couple of different reasons. One of those is capillary action. This is a relatively short distance movement of water. In general, you'll get water that move, moves upwards in clay soils a lot more than sandy soils. But capillary action in and of itself can form salt pans. So for example, you can get extensive salt pans that occur because of deposition of salts and evaporation, but also within a typical soil, I'll go back, also within a typical soil that you can have rainwater that penetrates to a certain degree and evaporation from the top, and then just through capillary action alone, movement of water back up through the soil to the soil surface where it then evaporates. But as that water moves up through the soil profile, it's gonna take materials with it that have dissolved and then when they get to the soil surface they're going to precipitate out as you have evaporation and then you can get in these in dry areas large expanses of salt that form on the soil surface and again this is just the extent that you can see in relatively dry areas of salt pans that occur now in addition poor drainage is a situation where we can get precipitation and transfers of materials so for example, in waterlogged areas, areas where there's a high water table and typically saturated soils, you can get minerals that accumulate at the interface between waterlogged, which are anaerobic, and aerobic soils. So if we look at our soil profile, for example, and you go down, that if you have a relatively high water table where there's water here, there's still minerals that are there and, and the soil material, but this part has oxygen in it and this part doesn't. And at that interface between the two, you can get minerals that accumulate. And in some soils, we'll often find oxides that precipitate at that surface of the water table. And these are often oxides of iron or manganese. Here's an example of a glaze soil that shows the interface between an anoxic and an oxic layer. And you can see there's a fairly substantial color change down here versus over here. And what this is is differences in redox potential. So this is a relative, tends to be on average high oxygen concentrations above and low ox oxygen concentrations below, which gives you differences in the precipitates that happen. So different iron precipitates in the oxic layer versus the anoxic layer. And these are called glay soils. And you can see these tend to be pretty hydric. We're standing water, pooling water in the bottom of this pit. Now, another example of that the authors use is plinthite. And this is something you can find in tropical systems. And when you have iron and aluminum rich material in tropical soils, they can harden irreversibly with repeated cycles of wetting and drying. Here's a couple of examples of plinthite that you find. 
and this is probably if you have to focus on one photo focus on this one and essentially this layer right here has just been turned into a giant brick water is going to have a hard time penetrating through here roots can't penetrate and you just have this rock layer that gets formed secondarily here are plinthite bricks that have been mined from the subsoil and are then going to be used for construction of houses now plants and animals also have the ability to transfer materials up and down through soil profiles. When I was a kid, one of the places that I would often go hiking was the North Chagrin Reservation in Northeast Ohio. And walking through those trails, there was always be trees that had been tipped over and toppled by the wind. And when they toppled over, they didn't just snap off, but the entire root system would be brought upwards. And they were taller than I was, sometimes 10 feet tall. And so this right here is a tree in that area that had been toppled over. And you can see the entire root system had come up and it had brought a huge amount of soil and rock with it. This is a vertical movement of soil because it's bringing it down and then taking it up, putting it on top of the soil. And what happens is that as those roots decompose and now as that soil falls, you have what's called a pit and mound system. So you had soil that was like this with a tree growing in it, with roots growing out, and then it gets toppled over. And those roots are now vertical, and you have this large amount of soil that's been brought upwards. What happens over time, as it starts to fall down, is that you end up with a mound of soil and a pit down below. This becomes a low area down here where O horizon and A horizon soil has been moved over here, and then we have a mound that's relatively high. And it's going to be a lot better drain than something down here. And this is almost a, a perturbation to the soil. It's turbation of the soil. It's a mixing of the soil. This here is an old pit and mound system. And you can see the pit here and the mound there. And this becomes new substrate for plants to colonize on. And often these will pull up with water and become habitat. But you can see that this would really change the soil profile because you've taken all the soil that was over here and stuck it on top there. Now, in addition to plants, animals also will have large effects on the soils and move soils vertically. This is a, a burrow from a gopher in the soil. And essentially, the, when they excavate out their burrows, the burrow comes through like this. There's a hole here, and then they kick the soil out in these directions. And again, that's movement of subsoil up to the surface and bearing of the surface soil. Now, a lot of other animals also have big effects on the soils. We talked a little bit about termites, for example, and their movement of soils upwards through that soil profile. So soils are impacted by a number of factors. Some of those are strictly chemical, for example, but also there's a lot of movement upwards and downwards through that system changes to that soil caused by plants and animals and interactions with other factors.